thing is just she could see the slide. That's the only thing. All right, here we go. And you got rid of the thing at the bottom. Yeah. So um, let me stop recording. Oops. I don't want to record yet, do I? No. Not until we get everybody in here. Oh, I think so. All right, babe. Okay, good. Back to making the Old Testament. Uh, I sent you some additional slides as well. I don't know if you had a chance to review them or not. They're kind of like a travel log. Uh, some pictures I took when I was uh, in uh, in the Sinai Desert. So I'm going to go over them quickly again with you. Uh, this is St. Catherine's Monastery uh, right here. This is a famous monastery. It's noted for uh, the large number of uh, um, old scrolls it has. Uh, it was built in 586 CE. Uh, it's the oldest continuously inhabited Christian monastery in the world. And as I said, possesses a rather uh, famous library that uh, not of books, but of scrolls that we can go and study as scholars. Uh, but anybody can come and visit. It's open to anybody. Uh, it also holds a huge number of uh, both Jewish and Christian manuscripts, as I said, those are handwritten documents and prized for its Codex, uh, Codex Sinaiticus. Sinaiticus is uh, a, a book that contains both the Old and New Testament uh, in, uh, in Greek. So it's a famous uh, text from which uh, so much of uh, the Bibles around the world have been created from that uh, particular uh, book. Uh, as well, it manages the largest collection of Christian icons in the world, or maybe second largest. The uh, Vatican City has quite a few as well, the Vatican Library. What country is that in? Uh, is that this Israel? is in the Sinai Desert. Oh, okay. So, in, in Egypt? between Egypt and Israel. So, right at the oh. tip of the Sinai Desert, uh, this is located. Um, again, this is the monastery. You can see all the people gathered around. I'll show you. What it looks like inside a little bit too. Uh, but this is a summit. That's the highest point. This is just the uh, closest forward, so it looks higher, but that's the highest point. And that's presumably where Moses went. Jebel means Mount, uh, Mount Moses. So mm -hmm. that's Mount Moses there. And you can climb up there. It takes about two hours to get up there. Oh my uh, you go up usually in the morning. Your guide will take you up in the morning before uh, there's any light. Because uh, the idea is to get up there and see the sunrise. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's quite a cool uh, uh, encounter. Uh, Holy Trinity Chapel is the chapel that's located, was built uh, up there. Uh, here are the uh, stairways that you take to get up there. So in 250 yeah. steps, once you climb far enough up on the rock, you can come to the uh, steps and they take you the rest of the way. And uh, if you get there at night, this is what it looks like at night. And you wait for a few minutes and you've got sunrise. They got this planned out uh, so perfectly, these guides. Because, you know, they're earning some money <laughs> to get you up to make this a great experience for you. Uh, so once you get up there, you look uh, west. And, of course, you see the east sun shining on the rest of the mountains as you're looking east. So that's quite a view. Uh, it's constructed in 1934, this little uh, chapel that's located up here. Uh, and it's famous because it's constructed very closely to the kind of cave-like area where it's presumed that uh, Moses once uh, hid out as he uh, allowed God to give him the Ten Commandments. This is what it looks like on the inside, not uh, easy to see. Uh, there, but uh, you kind of get an idea. It's, it's a fabulous little chapel. Uh, and again, you're looking off toward the east at this point, northeast. Not a lot of electricity there? Uh, no. <laughs> Any bathrooms? No, no electricity, uh, no porta potties. You got to be prepared to go up here. Oh, so, uh, and you're not going to stay up here very long, probably, because your guy will want to bring it down. So the next crew of people can get up there because they got people visiting these holy sites in Israel 
uh, all the time and in the Sinai Desert in Egypt. It's, uh, uh, well, you've been to Egypt, right? Maybe this fall. Oh, this yeah, fall, you're thinking fall. of going. Okay. Mainly, well, you're you, going to encounter a Christian or Jewish? Uh, uh, that's a Christian chapel. Yeah, yeah. it was built by the Episcopalians, actually. Uh, so uh, there have been several uh, in chapels up there. Uh, this is the latest rendition uh, that was built in 34. It's this area that I want to focus on over here uh, to your left. Um, and uh, you notice the cleft in the rock. Uh, your guide will tell you this is where Moses hid his face uh, in that little cleft in the rock. And uh, this is where God stood and gave him the Ten Commandments. Uh, the text tells you God stood on a rock. Uh, Moses was hiding in the cleft of, the, of a rock. And uh, God spoke to Moses and Moses saw the Shekinah, it's called in Hebrew, the, the glory of God. So why did Joseph go, Joseph go up there? Moses, why what? Moses, Moses. Why did he go up there? Moses? Moses. Moses. Moses, yeah. He was commanded to do so by God. Uh, and said that he would receive the law once he went up there that would become important for um, Israelite history. And the Bible, uh, the Torah, essentially. How much of the Torah? We don't know. Did he receive the whole Torah when he was up there? The Ten Commandments? What? It's usually, uh, you remember the movie, it just really shows two big tablets, right? Uh, however much he could write on two big tablets, I guess, was, uh, was it. Uh, and most presume it must have been the Ten Commandments. And over time, God expanded with the priest uh, some of the information that they needed to know. And uh, they eventually wrote it down. But that's kind of a funny. Nobody, no scholar believes that, of course. But uh, in, in fact, nobody <laughs> believes that, I don't think. Except the guy. The guy believes it, okay? Uh, so he's very convincing when he tells you he or she uh, that this is where God stood. Uh, if you look a little closer, you can see uh, this black area up there. The guy will even tell you that's the sweat of Moses' back that remains on the wall there. So presumably you can scrape a little bit of it. They won't let you do that. But you, if you could, you could scrape a little bit of that and test the DNA and you'd have Moses' DNA. How cool would that be, huh? Um, but apparently that's what the remains of his sweaty back is. It's backed into that little cleft. Uh, religious traditions are interesting, as all mythic stories uh, are. Do many Jews go up there? Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, any anybody who uh, I I would imagine that probably every Jew in Israel is already uh, Jewish uh, yeah, person has you know, been there all uh, because it's nearby. And most there's also a mosque up there. And I showed you a picture of the mosque and the stuff I sent you. So I'm assuming there are lots of Muslims that have been up there as well. And in the mosque, you can pray. It's a very little building right next to the chapel, but there are actually the two buildings there. And I've seen some pictures of those. Uh, this is Michelangelo's uh, uh, great sculpture of Moses uh, at the Church of St. Peter uh, in Vincoli. Uh, in Vincoli means in chains. It's known as St. Peter's in chains to distinguish it from all the other St. Peter's that are all over Rome, including the really big one, right? And that in the city. This is just outside uh, south uh, um, east of Vatican uh, City in Rome. But it's a beautiful, beautiful church. Uh, and uh, this uh, statuary of Moses is actually part of a huge collection of statues, sculptures that was done for uh, the uh, original, the first builder of St. Peter's in Vatican City. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica, the really big church. Um, and so presumably um, Julian II, who uh, uh, dug the cornerstone, uh, the spot for the cornerstone of St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City, is, uh, was to be buried here, but eventually he was buried in, in the Vatican as well. But at least this remains, and it's interesting. Anything interesting about that statue you notice? He well, you like see that he's got the tablets there. It looks like he's got horns on his head. That's exactly what it but, looks but, like. But, but, yeah. but, well, maybe they're correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, horns on his head. In the Renaissance period, every, every painting of Moses, every sculpture of Moses had horns. Uh, there are a few earlier uh, paintings and sculptures that we have that also uh, had horns. But why did they have horns? Uh, they had horns because in the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate by Jerome, 
Uh, Exodus 34 through uh, 29 through 30 uh, tells about Moses being up there and God talking to him and seeing the radiance of God. And it kind of splashed back on him. And as a result, he grew horns. Um, why do we think that? Because of this verse. And when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he held the two tablets of the testimony before the people. Uh, and, he, and he knew uh, that his face was horn from a conversation with the Lord. Or he knew not. He knew. He knew, knew not. Uh, knew not that his face was horn. But it was horn. He did have horns. Uh, but he didn't know it. And all the people saw it. Okay, so he's got horns. Uh, that's how they know he talked to God. He's got horns in his head. <laughs> you know I mean? Uh, that's what they thought. That's what the uh, word says in Hebrew, or does it? Uh, you got to remember that uh, the word, the word in Hebrew, uh, uh, words are always just the consonants. They don't have the vowels. Um, and so Saint Jerome actually mistranslated the Hebrew word. It wasn't. Uh, it's karan and not keren. He translated it as keren. Uh, uh, the former meaning radiance which makes sense, right? And then they saw he, he was radiant. Uh, that would make sense. His face was radiant. Uh, but uh, Jerome translated it as horn. <laughs> and and that's, kind of, that's kind of devilish. I mean, that would yeah. be... Well, yeah. I mean, I mean it how kind weird. of sends, how to weird us, it sends a different... Yeah. Uh, right. But not to them. They uh, In Jerome's day, he, he thought he was getting the word right. He thought it was Karen. But, how, uh, if but it's, it's really if it's only the consonants, how did they know that they're supposed to be A's instead of E's? Uh, because yeah, well, critical marks. It, you have to guess. So what makes sense? Horns or radiance? A radiant face or a horn face? You know, um, that would be one way of knowing. Okay. Uh, for a kid reading the text, that's how the kid would know. Uh, but of course, the parents would say the tradition tells us what it is. We know. Uh, and by the way, they had Hebrew texts back then that um, they were very familiar with. And so uh, radiance made sense to them. So technically, you're right. It could be a uh, horn. <laughs> and that's what Jerome thought. But uh, no Jew anywhere in the world thinks that. Uh, they all think it's radiance. Uh, and it makes more sense that you would read it that way. So it's really, it's pretty obvious it's a mistranslation or bad translation, we might say. Another interesting uh, little fact here for you is that the Israelites were not the first monotheist. Um, the first monotheist, the earliest monotheist we know in history was this guy, uh, and he's Egyptian. His name's Akhenaten. You know his wife, Nefertiti, uh, a little bit. Uh, in the 1300s, uh, the first monotheist. This is before the, uh, before the story of Moses um, that we historically give uh, later dates to. Uh, in the 1300s. But it's believed that at the time there were some Hebrew slaves that were probably in Israel, maybe not a whole lot, slaves from around the, excuse me, in Egypt, slaves from all around the world. When a country conquered uh, some other country, they would take slaves. That would just be the normal thing you to do. First, uh, uh, you mean the first uh, uh, out of Egypt, they, they believed there was only one God. Uh, the people yeah, in the, Egypt the at the time, in under guy. his rule, uh, that's what he believed, he and his family, and he probably convinced a large number of Egyptians since yeah. he's the leader. There was only one God. Yeah. One God. And one it was him. Person. One God. But this is the first leader that we know of that was a monotheist. In the ancient world. In yeah, the ancient world. The first world. monotheist. Uh, we oftentimes like to discover where religion begins, and particularly where religions, specific kinds of religions, uh, the Trinity, uh, uh, polytheism, monotheism. Monotheism probably, it probably was around a few other places as well, but uh, this guy made it a state religion, uh, and, monotheism. And the powerful so, Romans believed in many gods. Yeah, oh, yeah. they were polytheists, yeah. yeah. But they also believed in a sun god, the same god that this guy believed in. Ra, Ra, Ra. Ra, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here you got a wonderful uh, stele. This is a, a rock carving, uh, ancient rock carving, one of the earliest we have. We got Akhenaten and his uh, wife Nefertiti uh, back here, and there are three girls. And here they are going to the altar of the sun god, the sun disk, Aten, and worshiping him. 
So the one God was the Son. Was the Son. The one God. For them was the, was the Son. Well, that yeah. was the one God that he picked. That's so the, that, there's nothing bigger in the universe, you know, in their mind. Oh, so the it wasn't him that was the God. It was the Son. That was it's the, the Son, not, you know, not the Pharaoh. Uh, of course, pharaohs, when they die, if they're good pharaohs, just like the good Romans, uh, people believe they became gods. They were absorbed into uh, the sun, as it were, and uh, became gods themselves. The bad ones, like Nero, not so much. Romans didn't uh, make him a god. Uh, but Romans did make uh, others. Uh, but so, the, to distinguish this, they thought the concept that there was just one god and not many, but they thought that God was visible. Oh, yeah, he's a sun. visible God, but he's one God. Uh, and so instead of having an old man with a white beard and whatever, they had the sun. They had the sun. I, I like the sun better. So yeah. Like, it's kind <laughs> of, yeah. I like that. Yeah. 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 Well, a lot of people believe that today, you know. Oh, I mean, Indian, we have what's called know. neo sun God. Yeah, neo paganism. You've probably heard of that today. It's a popular, and they they maybe maybe you thought it was well. just for economy. Maybe they're just let's, let's easier. Let's just figure out what. Right, um, right. Maybe he, sure. he just right. wanted. He maybe it's a little wanted, cheaper. You don't yeah, have to yeah, go to a maybe, lot of gods' altars. You just go to this one. Lay out your money, your food there. Uh, so yeah, that's the story uh, behind that. Uh, the majority view uh, is this that. Uh, there were probably Egyptian slaves or Israelite slaves in Egypt at the time in the 1300s, uh, even earlier into the 1500s, uh, who were influenced. So a person like Moses coming along who becomes a leader of these people, he's going to be influenced by monotheism and probably take that back with him when he uh, leaves uh, during the Exodus. Um, if there was a Moses, uh, it's or several Moseses, we don't know, uh, probably led them out of Egypt around 1290. And again, probably a small group, not a giant group, um, as the scriptures seem to suggest. As the Torah, and that really Moses. happened, that really happened. There was, a, we don't there was know, an exodus of we don't know, we don't know. This is a, a pretty good assumption okay. uh, on the basis of the literature, but on a basis of the archaeology, we have no way of knowing. So. Uh, the Israelites reach the promised land. It's again, if it's a small group, they're probably not doing any conquering. They're probably coming home. And in a sense, uh, even if they didn't think of themselves as coming home, they probably found people who spoke their same language in Canaan, uh, tribal people uh, who may have already called themselves Israelites. And so they blended in with them and became a larger community. Uh, that's the more likely scenario simply because we don't have any, again, archeological evidence that helps us from a historical point of view, uh, be convinced that uh, there was any kind of conquering of uh, the land. So all those stories of conquering and violence and bloodshed and all that are probably a later uh, view of how this all happened uh, as a way of bringing about a sense of national identity, you know, like our Revolutionary War, right? It's always nice to have a war to start a country because <laughs> uh, it makes you feel, you know, you've got blood and guts into this uh, experiment of this new country. Uh, and that's sort of what's going on here, we think. As for their religion, their belief in God, the speculation is, and again, it's just speculation, but it's, it's intelligent, high-quality, educated speculation. Uh, that Akhenaten's monotheism in the 1300s is kind of the source for this later monotheism that these people in Egypt, these slaves in Egypt, brought to the new land up north and what became Israel. Okay, again, uh, if we're to take this story literally, uh, we could certainly associate it with uh, this particular pharaoh, Ramses II. So this is the pharaoh defeated by the biblical Moses, according to uh, the most conservative of traditions uh, today, Ramses II. Do we have some idea that Ramses II actually existed? Oh, yeah, yeah, no. The, the thing is, is when it comes to these big leaders like Alexander the Great and Caesar, so much evidence, uh, archaeological evidence, so much uh, um, literary evidence. There's a lot of evidence when it comes to major figures, but little religious figures that only a uh, small, in the beginning, a small group of people hang out with, you got less information about them. Uh, so you have to start developing the evidence to 
uh, give yourself you had a historian. Actual, you had actual dates for him. Yes, yes, right, right. We know exactly uh, his dates and the dates of the Assyrian kings. And Syriologists, they study that uh -huh. uh, to know him. Now, the Egyptians had their written language. Yes, hieroglyphics. And, and, and what about Moses? What kind of language did he have? Uh, the, the language of ancient Hebrew, old Hebrew, is the language that, you know, the uh, Canaanite tribe of Israel used. Uh, that was their language. And that was a tribal language in uh, Canaan. But, the, but it was written in that kind of something like the Egyptian language? Or? No, it's Hebrew is very different. Yeah, very it's different. very different. It has those constants. It kind of lays the groundwork for so much of our modern uh, understanding of how language should be constructed. Uh, hieroglyphics are just pictures, right? Mm -hmm. So picture language. Um, that was a lot of work. Picture language. Can you imagine, you know, writing a letter today or on your computer, have to figure out the picture, you know, uh, to create. Wasn't that. it like Chinese? Yeah, Can't... like Chinese. Well, yeah. Chinese is picture too, but it's still abstract. Oh. If you look at it, it's still very much like the Hebrew. It's, it's very abstract kind of symbols for language, mm. which doesn't take up nearly so much space. So that's true for all of our um, uh, language, all of our uh, alphabet. Our alphabet is made up of this symbolic thing. Turn an A on the side, and what do you have? Kind of a buffalo, right? You turn an A on the side of capital A. Uh, so that's a symbolic thing. Uh, what about Moses? Conclusion here, <clears throat> as I mentioned last time, is more of a fictitious and legendary figure uh, than a historical one. Uh, the biblical Moses stories uh, give us a wealth of historical information about nation building. So as historians, this is important to us. We want to learn how the Assyrians and the other countries uh, at the time built their nations that lasted for such a long time. Uh, what is nation building goes into nation building. And uh, the Bible can actually help us as historians understand that. So it's not just a religious text for us as historians. Um, especially among believers, uh, but it's also a text that gives us the tools for understanding how nations are filled. Uh, and uh, as well as these stories are entertaining, they're fun to read. Uh, even war stories are fun for kids, you know, who like to go out and play war games, I guess. Um, but, you know, they're, they're entertainment. Massive and, amount of entertainment. And, and, and what do I have here? Oh. And some ethical lessons, too. So you get a few ethical lessons uh, in the midst of all this. That's the reason this becomes religious literature and the reason parents use it to talk to their children uh, throughout history, throughout the Middle Ages, uh, up into modern times. Okay, any questions or reactions to that part? Well, just, uh, I mean, uh, I know a fair amount of it's right, but, but there's a lot of... Um, God tells you to wipe out this people. God tells you to wipe out that people. And how is that? Yeah, that doesn't guess, sit very well with us, right? Well, uh, today, but yeah, what, what's the ethical lesson there? Um, what say about that, God? That part may not, maybe not so much uh, from our perspective, yeah. but it could uh, tell us, you know, that it's important to stand up for what is right and just and to uh, demand justice in the world and things like that. It could be used for a parent to tell kids something along that line. I, I think it's the same reason why we tell about manifest destiny mm -hmm. and the well, and the taking yeah. over of the American that West and, and how, you know, we, the, no, we expanded. Really and justice to us if this is what we are intended it's, to do. It's that we're such a fierce tribe. No one can come and dominate us anymore. We're not going to be slaves. We're we worked gonna... hard for this. You yeah, know? this is our land. <laughs> right? This, this is our land. This land is, our, this land is ours. Yeah. God yeah. gave this land to us. Yeah. You know, historically, about there were a lot of small tribes out in yes. this area, yeah. Canaan, and they yeah. probably were fighting and warring with each other. Oh, certainly. For, yeah. the right. land and what I mean, it's it's hard to come in to another person's yeah. territory and say, "Hey, we're we're going to take this over now." Yeah, yeah and they go, "Oh, okay." <laughs> so well, there are some levels. The oldest city in the world is the city of uh, um, in Israel of. Uh, uh, I think I just lost it. <laughs> so all this Moses Jaffa stuff or... is all uh, nothing more. It, it's fictitious. 
Yeah. And then later, uh, somebody put together this, these stories yeah. and so forth. Right. How much later was that? From what, from a lot back? later. A, a lot. lot. That's what we're going How to get into. How many years later did they invent the stories? A like, lot later. Yeah, probably yeah. hundreds of years. Damascus. Centuries. If, if the Jew, if, if the Jew, Jewish um, people, they they did not write. They they were not able to write things down. Now, if this had happened in in Egypt, where they were writing things down, you would have more historical evidence. Yes. But because these people did not write. But back in the day, the way history was was uh, was by by mouth. Yeah. By by parents telling the children, and it was the, the storytellers. So we can't discount that as a no, historical reference. Not. Really, can't if you had it. But, uh, but I mean, but I mean, I think what the Bible is is that historical speaking of what the people said. Well, it was, it's, it was it's a group of guys. Hundred years later, it, is the well, issue. right, but yeah. still, those stories came from somewhere. Yeah, right. and they were told and told and told and told. So we we can't. So I think the Bible is that. It's yeah. the, the it's these guys trying to figure out okay what did they say yeah. what were the tales and what they want to the and they're proud of their country a hundred years so several it, hundred years later they're very proud so of their country so you can't necessarily say it didn't happen you just don't have to you just don't happen to have the archaeological tablet, the, 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 the tablet oh no we're not saying it didn't happen we're just so saying it mean, probably didn't it. happen yeah well, so why, got different, why are you saying it probably didn't happen because historians got different criteria that they work with. Yeah. Some things probably happened, some things probably didn't. They're probably with some kind of little exodus, but and historians have kind of come around to thinking that's the case. That's the um, general view today on the part the of scholars. Consensus. Uh, but at the same time, it's not clear that it happened the way the Bible said no, it happened. But still, but point. still, something happened. Something happened. Something happened, and I don't think you can discount that. Oh you no, know, no, you know, no, no historian does because that because they spent so much time on it. You know, they, they, yeah. really, they really, they really did. No yeah. historian does that. Discounts everything. They, that's yeah. why I say we look at this. This is very helpful to help us. The Bible is to help us understand nation building. But it doesn't give us the kind of details that you would find in a modern historical textbook. So there, there's a difference there. How do they come up with what they have in the textbook? What your kids are reading in textbooks? How do they come up with that? A lot of work goes into it. That's what scholars do. Yeah. Um, I, I used to hear uh, reasoning. People would study the the Red Sea and the possibility that it was parted, and that or that you know something. Something actually happened to cause them to be able to cross this Red Sea, uh, the weather, whatever it was. Are, is there any of that evidence that suggests there was any they sort had of a National path? Geographic had on about six months ago. They studied the Red Sea. Yeah. And there's a certain part near Saudi Arabia that they found they're going to make into a park, which worries them. That at that point, the bottom of the six is high. And when the water is out, you can walk over it waist high. Yeah, but it's they, actually, well, here's a little piece of information that might help understand this better. In the Hebrew, it doesn't say the Red Sea. Later on, when the Hebrew is translated into Greek, the Greek uh, writers put in Red Sea. Uh, they put in the wrong, again, there's a mystery. We've got so many mistranslations. The Reed Sea? Over. It's the Reed Sea. The Reed Sea, that's what you ask, go to any synagogue and ask a Jew, did Moses cross the Red Sea? Be, you mean the Reed Sea. <laughs> they will tell you that because they know their Hebrew Bible. Are they two different places? They are. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Red Sea is really huge, okay. right? The, uh, but, okay. And you can see it on a map. Um, and even the Red Sea, there had been people who thought it was the Gulf of Aqaba. Maybe he crossed a little span of the Gulf of Aqaba. Can you give us that? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, however you read the text, the text is a miraculous text because it happened at the time that Moses prayed for God to make it happen. So it's a miracle, right? If you believe in miracles, then, you know, you have no issue here. Whether it's the Reed Sea, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's a miracle. Uh, but if you don't believe in miracles, then you want to find out, well, what else could it have been? And this is the other thing it could have been. The Mediterranean has big winds that come in that blow across in the northern portion there. Um, blow across the uh, water that you can't walk across uh, because it's all swamp. You know, unless you're a swamp monster, you can't get across it. 
Uh, but when a wing comes in, it can dry out a certain portion of just, that land so that you can area. walk across it. It was just this very tiny area that you could walk across. So if you want to believe this story as uh, it's written up in the Bible, it is easier to read it in Hebrew than it is to read it in a later language, Greek, when it was translated into Greek. So it was translated into Greek as the Red Sea. The text says the Reed Sea uh, in Hebrew. And do we know where the Reed Sea is? Up north, oh, yeah. way up north, way up near north. the Mediterranean. Okay. I um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, um, gold box or something like that. It's Moses. Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, and somebody's looking for that. <laughs> you, you've seen the movie. <laughs> oh, what's the deal there? What's the Oh, uh, that's a long story. That's well, you guys got wonderful questions, but those are hard questions and long stories. Uh, but in short, uh, again, if you think the story is giving you enormous accuracy, no, I don't. I don't believe that. But yeah. I don't think it can be just. I don't think we can discount it. No, because there, there was years and years and years of so much effort put in. There must have been something that happened. You know, a good there, analogy. You know, there must have been some 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 very strange things that happened that people wanted to remember. A good and, analogy to that you know would I mean? be uh, slavery in this country, right? I mean, slaves in this country also told stories of their life. And they passed it on from one generation to that's the next. The way they, that's next. the way they passed history now. Yeah. No other way. Uh, through their memory. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but memories are not always so good. Uh, but nevertheless, they're wonderful stories, and you don't want to discount them. You oh, want yeah. to you can't. pay attention to them. Yeah. Uh, but they're not the same thing as having the kind of their historical evidence, they're just not great historical evidence, right? I mean, if you were in a court of law. Best way of thinking about a historian, what a historian does is what a either a prosecutor does in a court of law as they gather evidence for something and how they go about it, or a journalist. Uh, those are good analogies to what a historian does. And you got to be careful because your peers are looking over your shoulders, right? And they will tell you if you make mistakes or if you're speculating too much or maybe not speculating enough. They'll tell you that sort of stuff, and you won't get your stuff published in peer review articles, as you probably know from uh, oh, yeah. uh, your work. Good questions. Good point. <clears throat> okay. Uh, our discussion uh, today is on the Torah. I think we get through it rather yeah. quickly here. 10, we, 10, we did this last time. Hmm. And we'll pick up where we leave off. As you know, the books of the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I'm assuming you saw the film uh, that I sent you, so that will help you out a whole lot. Uh, the Bible does not explicitly tell us who wrote the five books of the Old Testament. Um, if you believe Moses wrote it, I think Dave wrote this up last time. You got a little bit of a problem with the death of Moses in the last chapter, uh, 34, <laughs> you don't expect Moses is, uh, but his lieutenant could have written it, right? This could be the one passage in the Pentateuch that uh, his lieutenant Joshua wrote about the death of his leader. Uh, the first title, the first use of this title, the five books of Moses, which has become common to us today, uh, are, is in the Babylonian Talmud, and that wasn't completed until the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. Uh, so that's the first time we hear that, and if you go into a library, it's a 20-volume set of encyclopedic documents, three million words, uh, this is important to Jews, especially the oh, more yeah. conservative they are. In their high schools called yeshivas, for instance, they will teach uh, all the sciences and arithmetic and all that, and then also have a class on the Talmud. So they include that, both the Bible and the Talmud. Well, who is Jerome? Jerome was a Christian writer in the 300s uh, CE, and he's who gave us uh, the Bible that was used throughout the Middle Ages, the Vulgate. Was he considered a saint for the Catholic Church? Oh, yeah, he's called Saint Jerome. Saint right Jerome, and he, he, he put these books together. Uh, he he was one person who did do that. Yeah, there were many that did it. Yeah. He did it in Latin. So what he did was he translated the Hebrew and the Greek into Latin uh -huh. and made that available to the Catholic Church, the medieval church. Uh, and that's To the whole the population who spoke Latin. Yes, right, right. <laughs> right. and the many who could read it, especially the priests throughout the Middle Ages. Uh, but the first that. guy to give us uh, the Bible that we call the Torah, um, 
That happened during the exilic period in 586 BCE uh, when Babylon came into Jerusalem and took many Jews, the best and the brightest, the elite, not everybody, but the best and the brightest back to their home uh, town in uh, Babylon. Uh, and when they came in, one of the people who was born there uh, over the many years that Jews were living in Babylon was this man, Ezra. Uh, and we have a book of the Bible named after him. He is a fifth century or a, a picture of him. He's a fifth century BCE priestly scribe uh, who returned from exile in Babylon, uh, put together our first Bible. Uh, using uh, the sacred scrolls. There are probably lots of other sacred scrolls, but he just used these. He collected these, and that became the Bible. Uh, the Hebrew so, Bible. The Hebrew Bible, yes. Yeah. Uh, later on, a man by the name of Julius Wellhausen, who you learned about a little in the film, a uh, German Lutheran scholar, uh, gave us a book called The Introduction to the History of Israel uh, in German, and that has become the foundation for scholarship ever since. So this guy did us a great service, laid the groundwork for our understanding of how the Bible was put together. Uh, today, uh, most uh, scholars agree with him uh, nearly unanimously uh, that uh, this text was put together uh, by a number of different schools, uh, and Ezra eventually published it into a massive document. Uh, this is called the Documentary Hypothesis. So it's a theory like gravity. If you can believe in gravity, for me, you can believe in this uh, because they're, uh, they have the same kind of quality evidence that support them. So restate that. So Ezra came along and created the Torah out of many traditions. In the, our first Bible. So he's okay. the first person to give us the Hebrew Bible. But many, many mm -hmm. centuries later, of course, with uh, Wellhausen, uh, he gives us the first scholarly way of understanding all that okay. material, how it was brought together. Got it. How is uh, Ezra brought it together? And you saw this. Uh, the one thing you notice is that the Bible, the Torah is put together in a variety of layers. It's not just, uh, oh, one person wrote this, one wrote this, but schools of people uh, early on thought this was a Bible, then they added something to this, and then they added something to these, and then they added something to these. Uh, and eventually we have. The text being enlarged, Genesis enlarged, Exodus, Leviticus, of course, and Deuteronomy are pretty much uh, one school, uh, collection of schools. Uh, but these three certainly um, are striations of layers of tradition over time. They keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like pouring concrete on concrete, and it gets higher and higher and higher. Right? That must have been a very important story that they wanted to tell that they spent so much time oh, and so much energy sure. on that. That that story was really important. They did not want Nation to lose building. that story. Yeah, they did not want to lose yeah, that story. Yeah, it's how it's the same way with us when we tell the story to our kids of the Revolutionary War. What do we tell them? You know, it happened way back then with George Washington. What do we tell them? I have a I have a Jefferson Bible. Oh yeah. <laughs> Jefferson took the Bible and Took scissors and cut. He did indeed. He did <laughs> what indeed. Do you what do you what was impossible? <laughs> oh, I see. Forget that's right. That. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So he. That's a good he point. Came up with his own little he did Bible. indeed. People do that. They play around with these things over time, right? And they eventually come up with something pretty clever. Pretty Why good. wouldn't Ezra or anybody that was collecting all these stories together unify the stories instead of having 30 or so double stories of? Uh, two accounts of the same event. Well, he did. He blend them together. So if you read Genesis, for instance, you have Genesis 1, which tells us the creation story. Then you have Genesis 2 and 3, which tells us the creation story all over again. Yeah. It just tells us in a different way. Maybe they were smart guys and he wanted to give them credit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe he thought, no, we can't throw this guy. He's, a, he's a, an important rabbi somewhere. Yeah, Luke yeah. and some other were very similar. In the New Testament. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what goes on in the Old Testament, though. They, it was a very complicated process, is the point. Well, Housen figured this out. Now, do you teach this at the university? I do. I do. I go much slower. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens to the, some of the students that listen to this? Um, most of them are fascinating, intrigued by it. But if you go slow enough, you can actually show them the details 
of why this makes sense. So, so you how well, you don't get in trouble with that. So, but no, I, I, okay. I, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm a nice guy, so I don't get it. And scholars, <laughs> you know, and scholars did that. I mean, that, that was a scholarly thing that, that they figured this out. I mean, there are some teachers who are, you know, kind of, this is the way it is and stuff like that. And of course, students don't like them, but um, um, you do I have, understand why people don't understand. You do have the occasional student. I do. Who's... Well, pastor they said that that was the word that, no God. that's but not the it, truth kind of you thing. see that's how i was raised i was raised as a fundamentalist christian so i know how they think uh, uh -huh. when i run into those and people. he says and to, I know them, how to have help your them. pastor come in and and we'll talk about it sure yeah and the she, they'll go to their pastor and then they come their back to class and they never me. say anything <laughs> is afraid that that's the end be. of the discussion they'll yeah. go to their pastor and the pastor will say no. I occasionally get a pastor in and he comes in and he ends up agreeing more with me than he does with his own student and students say, oh, I thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So who's Dr. maybe Matthew Rick Baker? knows something. <laughs> maybe all that training yeah. taught him something. So who is Dr. Matthew Baker? Uh, that's the guy who did the video. He's a Jewish Hi, guy. Hi, this is Matt Baker. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, this guy was the final editor uh, very early on. Uh, composed uh, at least the first part of the Bible that from his vantage point, there would never be any more Bible. This is it. This was the Bible that he brought back with him from Babylon so many years ago. Uh, made public, he actually read it out loud to the congregation. He's a powerful, charismatic leader, politician. And uh, people listened to him when he read this out. And this was their, not only their Bible, their religious document, this was their constitution. That's this was that, going to be the constitution. Was that the Lutheran church that no, 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 no. There were no churches back then. Oh, no Christianity oh, yet. This is, oh, this before, is way, way before early. Christ. Uh, so uh, here we go. Zerubbabel is talked about in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Persian king Cyrus uh, allowed the Jews to go back and any slaves in Babylon to return home. Zerubbabel is one of them. Ezra, another. Nehemiah. Zerubbabel was the first one. Uh, he rebuilt the, the walls of the temple. Uh, Ezra came along. Um, during uh, a successor king to Cyrus by the name of Artaxerxes I, gave us the law, uh, which for him was the Torah, which included a few extra books, uh, nine books altogether, not only uh, the Torah, but a few of the major prophets. And then Nehemiah came along and built the wall. This is BCE or CE? Yes, yes, BCE. No, BC. BC. Okay, a long so time ago. Before yeah. zero. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Negative numbers. Yeah. How many find the historical theory? Okay, you may find that uh, as I think makes sense, and my students do as well, that it's a little complicated how this thing is put together, but it's productive for historians. That's what's important in science, what's useful. If it's not useful, it's not a good theory. If it's a useful theory, we keep using it until it no longer is. Once you use a useful theory long enough, people start thinking of it as a law. So sometimes we talk about gravity. It's just a theory, but it's not just a theory. It's a really good theory. And today we think of the law of gravity, right? So you're saying... It's the same with the documentary. The study hypothesis. of history is a science. It is. And it works in a kind of similar way. It's not yeah. the same kind of science, but it is. It works uh, in a scientific sort of way. Okay. Uh, give you a good model of this that might help. And I use it for the students, and all of a sudden, you can see light bulbs go off. They get it. Uh, this is uh, our model, the American model, right? A pluribus unum. Anyone know what that means in Latin? Out in of English? many, one. Many. Yeah, out of many, one. Out of many, one. Out of many, one. So kind of keep that in mind. Out of many older fictional and non-fictional stories comes one great story that unifies many tribal peoples in Canaan uh, who speak Hebrew. Uh, into one great nation that becomes a nation of So Israel. are these the 12 tribes that are unified? Yeah, well, 12 tribes. 11. Again, you're, uh, yeah, 12 tribes are unified into one tribe. Yeah, uh, or however many there were. Ish. Yeah, 12 ish. <laughs> 12 is good. Uh, originating from many diverse sources, uh, as you saw, all those layers, right? Those various sources, those schools who, gave their ideas and eventually they were put together in a book coming from all the different 12 tribes of Israel. 
The Torah may be the most popular, impressive set of books ever written. Every genre of literature is represented. Its stories are poignant, stunning, moving, rousing, empathetic, affected, uh, with a high level of drama, in my judgment. Uh, while it is not mere history, it does contain history. I'm not denying that. While it's not mere history per se, uh, it is of immense historical value to us. And the Torah was uh, Matthew, Mark, I mean, I mean Genesis, Exodus, the four. The, four, the, the five, five. The five. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, yeah. Numbers, and Deuteronomy are the five, Torah. Five, 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 five. Then Ezra's Bible contained the major prophets, which were Samuel, King, and Kings. So altogether, you had the five plus okay, what so in four. the Christian Bible is four more. That'd be nine. So plus. that's two. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. How that's many kings? Oh, that's the Torah. A lot of kings. Just the first two, or <laughs> we'll the, talk about the, the kings a little later on. Oh, okay. uh, no, lots uh, the whole oh the whole book of Kings and the whole book of Samuel, including all four of them. Yeah. So Ezra looks back at that history. He knows there were a lot of kings before the Babylonian exile. He knows there were a lot of kings before 586. And both Samuel and Samuel talks mostly about Saul and David, a um, little bit about Solomon, but Solomon really is, is born kings along with all the other kings that came along. 1035. I, I don't, where's so where do we go? Where's Genesis and Exodus? We go to 10, ten more minutes. Okay. Where's Genesis and Exodus on your... It's kind of hard to see on that. You may have to take it home and uh, look at it, but uh, they're, uh, okay, they're so in the... Torah. Yeah, where it says uh, the Torah, Torah at the top. Yeah. Let me get. Yeah, right there. I, I'm just trying to put this in, in <laughs> historical order. Yeah, where it said where the purple the Persian is. rule. Yeah. See the purple? Yeah. That's the Torah. Okay. Yeah, I got that. Then the uh, prophets are in the blue. I, I see it, but I don't see the word Genesis on No, it. you don't oh, see it. Oh, uh, it's J E um, D and uh, P, which was talked about in the uh, okay. uh, right, the sorry. video. I, that's the documentary hypothesis, and that's the strata. So Jay is uh, getting into the weeds a little bit. I didn't okay. want to get too much that's in okay. here in the weeds because I know so it would be a lot. Those are the time sources focused on one guy. Yeah. Do right. they think there was this God that was an old man in the sky someplace, or what did they visualize God? Look, like? worked is good for them. Uh, other yeah. other countries had gods as well they visualize them as really big human beings right? yeah. yeah so was god uh image and likeness of us or uh yeah so yeah. it's an old man right well very wise know, old man god right the bible tells us in genesis that we're the image and likeness of god oh okay. uh, so everything we so have must have been like us think right? about your anatomy that's god's anatomy uh, how do we know that? Because it, God's anatomy is talked about in the Hebrew Bible. Every bit of it. <laughs> um, and he's always a man. <laughs> never a woman. Uh, but never a woman. Yeah. I guess not. What are the... Only once in a while, and we still don't in many in many places. <laughs> well, <laughs> what, people what say, happened to you guys? What happened here? People well, say, you guys, you guys are rising up now, right? There you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. By you guys, you mean women? Yeah. Right. Yeah. He looks at me. Yeah, looks at me. <laughs> <laughs> people say we create God in our own image, yeah. instead of God created us so in His own wrote image. So the Bible. Yeah. Because if you look at the society at the time, the older male, the patriarch, was in charge of everyone. There were slaves. There were masters and slaves. You know, you had a female child, and she was a good pawn for making marriages so that you could unite tribes and things like that. Well, that was God. Yeah. God was the big patriarch in the sky. And you had to do what he told you to do that's that's certainly one way of reading it. i think that's the way most of so them how did, that, how did they survive uh food did they manna, manna, manna oh you mean when they were oh the yeah uh, <laughs> they lived on whatever they could get no manna, i don't manna dropped from the sky and they ate it yeah it was okay. like Dub double portions on friday yes oh, that's what right. in, in his in the history <laughs> uh well first off i don't think this story 
ever happened the way the Bible says it happened. I think it there probably was an exodus. I think it was a small group of people. And to get a small, and I think those people probably went almost straight in a straight line uh, from Egypt uh, through the um, the uh, Reed Sea up in the north right into Palestine. No war. They just came in. They immigrated. It's immigrants. Just like immigrants coming from Mexico into this country. So immigrants. Must have lived a lot. Uh, not on farmland so much. There's lizards. But they were moving. Now well, they're <laughs> moving through this desert territory. They so they yeah. Think of the Mexicans coming through all that, through Mexico, yeah, right? They're all sit back there. They put in food in Mexico. Yeah, no, they get one in town. Well, they would have had flour and water. Well, then there were other animals that they could hunt and fish and find. Sure. Lizards and honey. Water and all that sort of thing. They go catch it. Bird uh, once in a while, yummy. Yeah. yeah. But but the, the question is, you know, historically, why did why did humans create a god? And I've always felt it, it's to is to feel like they have a little more control of their very scary environment. Yes. Right? So, they created, so they created. So they created the idea of God to help them. Right. right. To help them, and then they created right. these priests to be the inter intermediaries. Right. There was a wonderful program on on public TV about about the Mayan civilization and you know those, those guys uh, and apparently they found out that why did the Mayans leave well there was not very much rain the rain dropped and there was more pressure on those on those priests to do some miracles mm -hmm. so they did more and more um, uh, sacrifices of people and so yeah, that made yeah. them maybe friend more you know right, what I mean? so, right. but I mean that's why man Felt the need, I think. Is, would you? Is that not the I thought? Think the you're thinking, to it, yeah. I mean, have you guys asked that question? Why? Why? Do well, you I think of it as when I was a child. I mean, I, I go to the movies and I would see King Kong and scare the bejesus out of me, and I'd go home and lay in bed, and I knew my dad would be in the next room, and I knew he could come in, and when I had nightmares, he would come in and calm me down. Uh, he's the yeah. father in the sky who protects us, and we need protection sometimes from things. And so they, I think it's out of that kind of and they normal, needed, normal, very normal fear. They needed rain. Yes, they, they needed they need rain. They to needed to, to grow things. They needed exactly. animals to hunt. Yeah. And so this gave them a little edge. Yeah, God send the buffalo, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for the Native Americans. Yeah. The Mayans, what did they do? Sacrifice at the top. At the, at the very top. They, they cut did. their heart out. Yeah, the whole body. nine yards. Yeah, I think they did. Yeah, I think <laughs> they did. Girl, well, right? Okay, I guess we got to call I, it quits. <laughs> Uh, we'll see you again next Sunday. Uh, watch the film I send you. That'll help a lot, especially with some of the details you see. Uh, if you keep this right by your side as you're going through the film, that'll probably help. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thank you. And next time we'll talk about the prophecy. Because I, I visit my sister. Oh, Rick, what do you think about yeah, the, the guy that has a video at the end of it? Yeah, it is theory of how they came down. It's, it's, and yeah, several it's different theories. Is that accepted or not? Uh, all those theories are debated by scholars. And as she was suggesting, we don't know for certain how this goes. So, 